previously on the Outside of Sunday podcast. The kids and I lived on the base and we weren't able to leave unless we had a male chaperone with us. Um, I wasn't able to drive because the roads there are pretty intense and if you hit someone's dog or someone's pig, immediately out come all the locals with their machetes wanting compensation. Hey, you're listening to the Outside of Sunday podcast. Is your faith stuck on Sunday? Christianity was never meant to be constrained to a weekly church service. I'm Krista, and here you'll find discussions on the Bible, mum life, and of course, how to live your faith outside of Sunday. You were in Papua New Guinea as well during COVID. Did that have much of an impact on you as a community there and as a family? How did COVID even affect Papua New Guinea, if at all? Yeah, so it's so it was a very interesting experience leaving New Zealand, which was COVID free um, and very strict and regimented in how they dealt with, with Sorry, COVID. Could you just say what year this was? We went in twenty twenty one. Okay. So the first lockdown had been done. We'd got COVID out of New Zealand. The border was closed except for MIQ thing, and we kind of we left knowing that. You know, the border was closed, but we assumed that by the time we were ready to come back, everything would kind of be over. So we arrived there and in Papua New Guinea, there are so many deadly diseases that actually kill people that COVID, it was there. Mm-hmm. We caught it, but mm-hmm. like the people didn't even know that they had it Wow! because it was like not on a scale of like illnesses you don't want to get, you know. It's not that bad compared to what they deal with. Okay. And so it was kind of weird. Like they'd make money out of it. So there'd be certain shops that would be like, you have to wear a mask to come in here. So you pay a dollar for a mask to walk into the shop where everyone's got them dangling around their chins or the workers wear them like here or <laughs> just like just like a money-making scheme. Okay. Dan drove one day past like a local rugby game. He's like, oh, this will be interesting to see like PNG people playing rugby. So he turns up. And to get through the gate, you need to pay a dollar to get a mask. And then you walk in and there's not a mask to be seen. But someone's making money because it's like, yeah. there's a rule. You have to have a mask. Yeah. Whether you wear it or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so it kind of was not really a big deal over mm-hmm. there. Like I'm sure a lot of people had it. Um, and even like hygiene wise, we don't like, talking about like washing your hands. Like they, most of them like bathe in the ocean or in the river Uh it's not like you've got a tap and you're like washing your hands every yeah it's just a totally different world but about six seven months into our stay there my daughter broke her arm and this is where COVID came to affect us because at the time we like we didn't have access to the medical help that she needed she got flown well, she broke her arm. We didn't even know if it was broken. It definitely looked wrong, like bending the wrong way. But we, I didn't oh, know if no. she'd like dislocated her elbow or what. And she was absolutely beside herself. So we <sighs> called the mission doctor who lives in another part of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And they sent a plane out as soon as they could at dawn to pick her, picked her and Dan up, left me and the kids in WeWAC and took her up there. They did the x-rays and he just said like, he, normally he... F- He's he would fix it. He's fixed so many broken arms. Um, and all of the other missionaries who were with us were like, oh, you know, she It'll broke her right. arm. She broke her arm and, you know, Dr. Bud fixed it. And, you know, no worries. And I'm like, okay. Anyway, so I get this phone call from Dan. He's like, he's a pretty stoic sort of person, but like I could just tell the emotion in his voice. He's just like, Katie, it's bad. Oh, no. We we need to go back to New Zealand. And I'm like, oh, no. what? <laughs> and so how it had broken, she required surgery. And the mission doctor said, like, there might be someone in the country who could possibly do it, but you don't want to have that done here because you it's right with their glo- growth plates. It uh-huh. needs to be done by an orthopedic specialist. Mm-hmm. So we're like, okay. So Dan's like, you need to pack up the house. Um, we're going kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So um, I just, they have like a place called the Mission Barrel where like when you leave the country, like missionaries just leave behind their clothes and stuff so that other people can use it. Yeah. So I'm like just crying, like, you know, gathering up our stuff. I'm like, what do we even take back? 
we fly up to meet Abigail and then go to the capital city. Dan had already engaged our like um, insurance company in that. So then we flew to the capital city ready to go when we could. And then we realized that we there was like a flight the next day out of New Zealand, but they wouldn't we couldn't get on it because we didn't have an MIQ spot or an exemption to MIQ. Oh no. So we then had to apply for like an emergency exemption, mm-hmm. but it took like a whole week of until oh, we were approved. No. And, and poor Abigail. Yeah. So it was so bad. She And because we'd left the doctor, he'd given us pain relief, but not the not level that she needed. Yeah. So there was, she just got no sleep. She was in pain and just like very like animalistic, like just like, ugh, and oh. trying to like work out what was the right thing to do. We were like yeah. had all this – you know, media from New Zealand, like contacting us and we're like, Mm. oh, we don't actually want to cause a big fuss. We just need to get back. And um, it kind of got to like two or three days in and we're like, what do we do if we can't? Like we're waiting, we're waiting to hear and what if we can't? And then we had like a friend that I knew kind of emailed me and said like, could you send the x-rays to me and I'll show my surgeon husband and he can make a recommendation because he had been to Papua New Guinea or done like a placement Mm -hmm. at a hospital wow so she I sent it to her and she's like if you go to this hospital and see this person yeah they I think they could do it so we're like okay in Papua New Guinea in Papua New Guinea so we're like okay this is our new plan and then Dan calls the insurance company and said like okay hold off we're going to take her because it was just getting so bad. We're yeah. like, we just need it to be done. And then the insurance company kind of came back and said, oh, well, it's up to you to do that. But if you do make that decision and anything goes wrong, your cover is gone because they had to go off that first like plan. Plan, like, you know, it needs to be done out of country or whatever. Okay. So then we're like, what do we do? You know? Yeah. And. I ended up asking Abigail, like, what we could take you to a hospital now or we can wait to see if we can go back to New Zealand. But at that point we realised we wouldn't all be going back. It would just be Abigail and one parent could Mm go. I was like, you you know, we might not see the kids and daddy for this time. And this is crazy. So I have, uh, while I was homeschooling the kids over there, I was reading them all these missionary biographies. Mm Mm-hmm of like these amaz- amazing like missionaries who had done these crazy things. And then Abby, I was like, what about Elizabeth Kuhn? And I was like, what about her? Like, this is a, a missionary from that I'd read too much. She's like, remember how she didn't see her husband for like two years, but God was with her. Oh, and I'm just like, bless <laughs> she's, you, like she's like so miserable and horrible. But then she's like, preaching to me I'm like you know what that's right (laughs) so she made the decision so how old was she at this point she was I think nine at the time okay maybe 10 yeah she's 12 now Mm -hmm. probably nine I think um so then we just had to wait and what was the decision that she made sorry she wanted to go to New Zealand so she's like that was just so then in the end we got approval Mm -hmm. but then we had to make this journey it was a, a crazy time as well because the, the borders were closed. So now if you want to fly to Australia, there's like multiple flights a day coming yeah. in and out, back and mm-hmm. forth across the ditch. At that time, it was like one flight a week that mm-hmm. you could get on. Mm-hmm. And to be on it, you had to have an MIQ spot. And there was like all these stranded Kiwis around the world that are like trying yeah. to get home and are shut out and like having to use this like lottery system to even yeah. be able to come home. So like the fact that like we kind of – we didn't take anyone's spot in MIQ, but like kind of jumped the queue a little bit. Um, so then we had to travel back and then every step along the way was just like another boundary because to get on the plane, like we got into Brisbane and then uh, I'm like, I'm going to be the first one at the queue just to get everything done. Yeah. And I stood there for two hours because to put us on the plane, to give us a boarding pass, they had to enter our MIQ number. I was like, I don't have an MIQ number because we're not going to MIQ. We're going to Starship Hospital. And they're like, oh, yeah, but 
I need to be able to enter an MIQ number or we can't print it. Like it's what? And I'm like, look, here's a letter from Ashley Bloomfield. Here's a, you know, like yeah. I had all my documentation, but it was just like this technical thing. So then all the rest of the people on the flight come and they start boarding and I'm like, get me on this plane. Can I? And then I was like, like call Auckland mm-hmm. airport. There's going to be an ambulance waiting for us. Like this yeah. is, and I mean, it wasn't their fault. They were just mm-hmm. stuck in this system. And so we ended up making the plane late, but we, they did let us on eventually. I don't know in the end what did it. The mm-hmm. prayers of the saints around the world. We had so many people Amen. praying for us. It was yeah. crazy. Um, so we got on, but they made our flight late. And so then by the time we actually made it to Starship, the surgeon who was waiting for her had already gone home. Oh, no. And she had an x-ray done and it had already been healing in the wrong place. So Oh, no. I think yeah, it ended up being like eight days after she broke her arm that she had her surgery. Mm-hmm. And then we were in quarantine in hospital with... Yeah, so no one could come in and out. Any time a nurse needed to do anything, they had to put on like a full-on hazmat suit. Like, oops, sorry, microphone. That's um, and like, you could only see their eyes. Like, we didn't have interaction with people. Why did they have a hazmat suit on? Because we were technically like in quarantine because we could have had COVID. Because, oh, yeah. okay. You can't have COVID in New Zealand. Yeah. And I was like, we already had it like two months ago. We don't have it right now. They had yeah. to just keep testing us. We had to follow all of the rules. There was a security guard like parked outside our room to wow. make sure that we didn't escape. Wow. Because Intense. you don't want to let COVID into the country. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, each day we were allowed like half an hour of exercise time to like go for a walk. But we're in a hospital. So they get like this whole crew of like security guards walking in front of us, behind us. Like this is honestly so extreme. It was that is so extreme. So we're like walking down the hallway, and then every door they open, quarantine coming through, don't come out. You know, like just making sure. Then we go into like a elevator, which is then no one else is allowed in the elevator till it's been like. um, Yeah, disinfected. Sorry, (laughs) my crew's getting a beating here. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it was just actually wild and so we had no contact with people um and I just had Abigail there with me who was a mess and it was just yeah the hardest week of my life for sure my wow. hair was falling out like I'd have a shower it oh was like Katie bunches of I'm like yeah it was so so crazy well wow. anyway where do I go from there we finally get out um and then it took probably two months and from when we left PNG to get back mm. to Dan and the family. And yeah, yeah so this is where it comes wow. in. My sanctification earlier <laughs> in suffering, which I thought I was suffering then, mm-hmm. was nothing. Wow. And then I'm like, okay, I've been tested. And mm-hmm. this is where the test really comes to it. And so I just kept preaching that first Peter to myself. Mm-hmm. And this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuine genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of jesus christ preached it to myself over and over again this is a necessary trial from god Mm. and it is worth more than gold and it was such like when i say it's the hardest time in my life it was the best thing that could have happened to me because i had everything stripped away not just like fellowship it was Mm -hmm. like my my husband, who I rely on so much for so much, my kids, like my youngest child was like two. Mm. He never left me in his life. And it's like, wow, gone. Like I felt so bad leaving him. And, and then my one child that I did have was not pleasant company. She was like so mentally, physically, just like, yeah. anyway. But what I've discovered in that time is that Christ is enough. You can sing it in your worship songs. You can, you're yeah. all I need. You're all I ever wanted. <laughs> yep. He is actually mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. And even if my entire family died, if everything went wrong, I would still have Christ and he yeah. is all I need. And mm-hmm. what a blessing to know and not just know it as a fact, but to understand it and have it. So now walking through, coming back to New Zealand and my life mm-hmm. is a whole lot easier here. It's so much harder to shake me because I have that solid Mm. um, hope and foundation. And Mm. yeah, so 
I look back on it and I'm like, that was crazy. I can't believe that happened. Yeah. But I'm like so thankful that it did. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So pray for suffering, <laughs> but don't. <laughs> he answered Do my prayer. <laughs> he, he answered my prayer, but just not how I had planned, how I would have planned it for myself. But no. yeah, it was so, so, so good. And yeah. Wow. What an encouragement, Katie. Like mm-hmm. what an encouragement, man. I'm just like, I can't even, I'm almost crying because I'm just amazed at what you've been through and just how much goodness has come out of that like what you said gold what a Mm. gift but also so hard and I think people hearing even what you say now like if my whole family died oh I have Christ and that is enough and I remember my mum saying that to me like once when I think I was like in my early 20s or something so it was ages ago not that long ago but you know it was ages ago and I remember her saying something like you know if dad ever died you know her husband if dad ever died I'd be okay I mean I'd be really sad but I'd be okay Mm -hmm. and you know about four years ago my dad did pass away and my mom has just been such a not that I'm saying she prayed for that of course not no way um but she just proved the truth of that Mm -hmm. and you have just proved so much of the truth of that that yes that is a solid foundation Christ is enough for us he is our firm foundation and if everything goes wrong even if like what you said even if our whole family is taken away from us we still have Christ and that is enough Mm -hmm. gosh I just like my mind is just like God you are so good Mm -hmm. so good now this might be tricky to put like a nail on but what stays with you most from your time in Papua New Guinea now that you're back in New Zealand? Um, So obviously all the things that I learned, but Mm. the main one would just be the importance of evangelism and sharing the gospel. So I have seen like the commitment and the sacrifice that the church planting missionaries make just to reach these people, the years it takes to even be able to share the gospel. And so I am just so convicted now living in New Zealand to be all about proclaiming mm-hmm. the gospel to people. So like now every Saturday afternoon that I'm free, our church mm-hmm. does like um, evangelism down at the lakefront. Awesome. And I'm there. We like we have no excuse because everyone you meet in New Zealand, even if English is their second language, can speak English. Mm-hmm. And everyone you know, you start with like a seven year head start on a church yeah. planting missionary. And it's like, why would we not when mm-hmm. we just have the easiest way to do it? And yeah. regardless of the reaction of the people who you're sharing it with, like, mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Like, if we love the lost and mm-hmm. if we take God at his word, we need to be mm-hmm. proclaiming his truth to everyone we can. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that's one of the biggest things and just yeah. trying to, yeah, live out what I believe. And to do that, you have to. You have to actually open your mouth and and yeah. share with people. Yeah. Yes, I'm 100% with you on that. I'm also super passionate about evangelism. I've done a lot of street evangelism and stuff like that. But this is, I suppose, the, the way that the Lord has been leading me recently is this media podcast, social media evangelism mm-hmm. on a different level. You're meeting people in a different place. You can meet people on the street. But you can actually meet people in social media as well. There are so many ways. That's the other thing. In Papua New Guinea, you have one way to reach the lost, which Mm -hmm. is to go to the lost directly Mm -hmm. and, you know, talk Mm -hmm. to them, figure out the language and all of that. But there are so many ways that we can reach people for Jesus in New Zealand. And, you know, each of us in our hand and our own gifting can have a way to reach the lost, I think, Mm -hmm. anyway. God has, it's God's mission, you know. So, yeah, let's Mm. get on board. Yeah, just when people say like, oh, I could never go and and be a missionary. I'm like, you don't have to. God doesn't call everyone to go overseas. He definitely, we need to be sending people. But Mm -hmm. man, there is a mission field right in front of us and in our own homes, in our own families, in our neighborhoods. And yeah, if you're not willing to go over there, you still need to be willing to share with the people God has put in your sphere of influence yeah and if you don't know how to do that there is so many awesome resources and ways that you can actually equip yourself to do that you don't need to um feel like oh i can't do that like literally 
if you go to YouTube and you can find some really great, like Living Waters is, mm-hmm. an, is a fantastic resource. Just go watch Ray Comfort do his thing and you will just be blown away. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a what an example there as well. Okay, I, I feel like I could almost end the podcast here. There was so much that you just shared with us that was amazing. But I want to talk a little bit about your homeschooling journey. Can we, is it all right? Are you yep. ready to move on? Okay. Yep. Um, so you are a qualified teacher as you said so did you teach for a while and what was it that made you kind of say actually I'm going to homeschool my children yeah so homeschooling was never on my radar I never thought that I would homeschool um yeah I had a sort of prejudice against it almost (laughs) like true you know (laughs) homeschoolers are weird um (laughs) they are by the way my children will be weird (laughs) in the best way um and so, yeah, I trained to be a teacher and I worked for, I don't know how many years before I had my daughter. And then in between each kid, I went back into part-time work. And then when my daughter was starting school, I really wanted her to attend where your kids go. Mm-hmm. Beautiful Christian school. Like, yeah, I only have love for that place. Um, and so in order for to pay her fees I had to work there too yeah so I was working and then after having my fourth child I was like okay this is maybe a bit too much for me right now to Mm. be teaching as well and then when we were going to Papua New Guinea there is no school over there for them so I was kind of forced to homeschool Mm -hmm. um and I kind of thought oh being a teacher I'll know what I'm doing it'll be easy it is a whole different thing it is a whole different thing I don't I think it's helpful that I have done a teaching degree, but any parent can homeschool their their kids. You don't need to have that teaching background. Mm-hmm. And so then I I enjoyed it. And I was kind of like, when we were coming back to New Zealand, I was like, oh, what do I do? Do I, I was kind of feeling torn because, yeah, I loved their school and I knew that they had been really lonely and isolated. Mm. And I'm like, it would be good for them to go back to school. And um, the principal sent me an email kind of saying like, what are your intentions? Mm. Um, Because there's now a big waiting list for the school. And um, she really wanted to leave spaces for all my kids to slot into, Mm -hmm. but she also had pressure to fill them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I heard that, I was like, man, there are three Christian children or families that want to send their kids to their school and I'm going to take their spots. My kids are going to take their spots when I can homeschool them, you know? Wow. So it's sort of like, um, yeah, so I kind of thought we'll just keep homeschooling for at least a year and then we'll see mm-hmm. what what happens. But now I'm committed. I'm, I'm all in <laughs> and I'm right. just going to carry on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not what I had thought I would be doing, um, mm-hmm. but I love it. Yeah. So you've you've completely – embraced it yes. you're all on yep. all on board yeah great and how how about your husband Dan how does he find it um yeah I think he just backs me and yeah I think he's seen the fruit in our kids lives of being at home and mm-hmm. learning in a home environment and just being able to you know work at where they're at and um yeah grow them in their strengths and then support them in their weaknesses and Mm -hmm. just in a way that isn't possible in a classroom Mm -hmm. like yeah I mean well who knows your children better than you and who loves your children better than you like yeah I I love the kids that I taught I Mm -hmm. absolutely had their best interests at heart and was would do everything I could Mm. possible to help them have the best outcomes but you've got 25 kids and you can't specifically meet all of their needs in a way that a mother could to their child so yeah yeah. Um, and just for people out there who are listening if you are homeschooling your children I think you're amazing if you're sending your kids to school you know what if you love the Lord and if you're teaching your children in the Lord you know what you're awesome too yeah I I definitely don't want my I definitely don't want my comments to be like Every single person should homeschool. (laughs) And this is like something that I'm really passionate about for the podcast as well, is to promote unity as Mm -hmm. much as possible. Like if if you homeschool, great. If you don't homeschool, great. Like we don't have to be like rivals. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah and I really don't get that from you but I'm just like putting it out there for, for the comment yeah. section even the fact that I am able to like that my husband earns enough money that I we can I am in we yeah. could be in a far better financial situation if I was also working like we're yeah. making sacrifices for me to not be working yeah but yeah I know that I it is I'm privileged to actually be have the opportunity to do this and mm -hmm. Lots of homeschool parents have to also work part time and yeah. just to make it happen. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's not for everyone, but mm. if you can do it, it's great. It's great. <laughs> That's so great. Mm. Okay. Um, any drawbacks to homeschooling? Yes, <laughs> many. So I think passionate homeschoolers can really romanticize it as if like it's or just a walk in the park and we're all, utopia yeah like our house is just springing with happiness and love all day long <laughs> that's not the reality <laughs> um and yeah personal sacrifice for the mother i mean i have my children with me 24 7 except yeah. for now they're with my mum. <laughs> yeah but i mean the goals that i would have like I want to be fit and active. In order to do that, I have to wake up super early in the morning mm. to go on a run and be back in time that when my kids wake up, I'm ready mm -hmm. for them and my husband can go to work. And mm -hmm. it's you have to definitely lay aside um, a lot of your own desires to make that sacrifice. And then also the kids, um, like having friends mm -hmm. is a different kind of friendship because at school they're with their peers 24 seven. Mm. And you have to be really intentional about making sure that your kids have the opportunities to be meeting with other kids and interacting. Thankfully, there is a growing group of homeschoolers around the place. So we meet up, you know, two or three times a week with other kids and um, get together with them. And I'm thankful the old school um, allows them to still participate in things like cross country and athletics. So they kind of get the school. Yeah things um yeah. in that way mm -hmm. and yeah we're missing the choir <laughs> the, yeah. my kids used to go there and hang out with their friends yeah. friday afternoons but mm -hmm. there is definitely a cost mm -hmm. to a cost to it and then just weighing up the benefits and the the cons and seeing yeah which hard would you rather have yeah yeah that's a good point which hard would you rather have yeah yeah, because it is hard. And I know, like you just said before, my kids are weird. And yeah, kids might get a little weird if they're homeschooled. I don't know. But kids also get weird <laughs> through public school. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> we're so blessed to be able to send our kids to a Christian school. But man, there's a lot of weird stuff going on <laughs> in the public school system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think your kids are going to end up as weird as you are. So, <laughs> <laughs> you're, I guess, yeah, there's less, um, they don't have kids being like, don't say that or like teasing them so they just don't realize that their quirks are mm. kind of unusual mm. <laughs> and kids don't stay kids too you know yeah. they're gonna grow they'll mature mm -hmm. and i think things will change mm -hmm. yeah what has been the best thing though about homeschooling um i just think that one of the hard things is they're with you 24 7 that's also one of the blessings and that mm. like you know them so well they know you so well you can like i think of um deuteronomy 6 where moses is commanding the israelites you know love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and says um and teach your children diligently mm -hmm. to to obey these commands and it says while i uh, talk about them while you yes. walk down the way while you're in your house while you sit mm -hmm. down while you rise and homeschooling gives you the opportunity to actually do that because they are with you mm -hmm. <laughs> all the time. So yeah. it's not just, you know, pockets of time. We're like, okay, this is our family's devotional time. Mm -hmm. It's like Always. we can pray yeah. at any moment. We can, mm. you know, point to God. We can confess our sin to our children and yes. seek forgiveness and just model mm -hmm. that. And then the other thing that I love is reading great books to my kids. Mm. That's been That's one of my favorite things to do. And it's amazing the impact that it has on on them, mm -hmm. like reading about people that are inspiring, but then also just like fictional stories that kind of give you a family experience together. Mm -hmm. So it's like you've been on this adventure together, even though it was just a book. Yeah. And then the kids like play those games or like uh -huh. um, characters in the books that are like 
have negative qualities or something and the kids are like hey don't be like and then name a character from a book like oh you sound like that you sound like edward yeah the they, line, the witch the they, <laughs> they have like it builds a culture mm-hmm. you've kind of got these shared experiences and then some of the books are just so great that dan will be home like i might read it during dinner time or something and then he gets into it. He's like, you can't read that book while I'm at work. <laughs> like, that's one that you read when I'm at home. So then I'll have, yeah. like, different books going because it's, like, it's cool. the whole – it's just, yeah, really bonding experience. And, yeah, I've really discovered just a love for that. And mm-hmm. it's had a big, big positive impact on the family. And, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, one book could you recommend us one book I'm like I, I feel like I need to get a recommended reading list oh, from you but like that if would you just be recommend so one. hard <laughs> there is a series that my kids have loved called The Wing Feather Saga yes I don't know I've if you've heard, heard of it but I, we haven't seen the books no. yeah so you can order them in New Zealand from um, Grace Books mm-hmm. um, if you want to get them not shipped from overseas for expensive mm-hmm. it's I had heard it recommended by lots of people and when I first started reading the first book I'm like why do people love this like it's kind of kooky weird mm-hmm. it's a little strange, bit sci-fi strange sort of, humor. Yeah, uh, yeah just yeah. like I don't get it but you you really get into it and then um by the end man I just cry like just about every time I was reading I was crying as a kid. Oh, it's okay I'm like <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so intense even as an adult um it's like yes. a, it's yeah. fictional but it's like uh-huh. kind of allegorical almost not like the I'm not can't compare it to the Pilgrim's Progress, but it's like mm-hmm. there's so much deep spiritual truth yeah. underlying it all, but then wrapped up with really quirky humor. Yeah, I heard someone like I didn't know that I liked it so much until I heard someone describe it. It's like a cross between the Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. and the Princess Bride. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so it's like I love both of those this movies. Epic, this epic yeah. tale of like, yeah, mm-hmm. you're following this big like saga. Yeah, but then interspersed in it is just like weird, random funniness. <laughs> so my kids loved that. Yeah. But um, there's like a series, um, Christian heroes then and now. There's just like biographies mm-hmm. of famous Christians. Awesome, super encouraging. Mm-hmm. Patricia Saint John, she's like mm-hmm. a author that has written some, yeah, from a Christian sort of perspective, but fictional mm-hmm. stories. Oh, there'd just be too many to mm. list. But you can find yeah. so many good book lists. That... Have you read The Little Pilgrim's Progress? Yes. Yes. Wait, I... the rabbit one or The, the Little Pilgrim's Journey? Yeah. So... I cried. I read that to a... We do that every summer. Mm-hmm. It's like our summer kind of reading. We do that every year. And every single time I cry. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's just so... The, it's the Lord, the goodness of God that is just shown through that. I'm just like, I love you, Jesus, so much. <laughs> yeah, I had read like a novel kids version of it before, and then now with the with the beautiful illustrations in that book and stuff, it's just like, why didn't I read this one first? It's I know, like, it's so yeah. great, it's so great. Okay, so if there is someone listening who is thinking about homeschooling their children, what advice would you give to them? Um. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, think about it. Just do it. You yeah. probably do need to think a little bit about it. So um, join the Facebook group for like homeschooling New Zealand. And there's like people with way more ex- expertise than me mm-hmm. um, who could help you. So you can't just decide I want to homeschool. You actually have to apply to the government to have an exemption. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. To take your kids. So it's a legal requirement to have your children enrolled in a school from six years onward. Okay. So if you've got a five-year-old and you want to try out homeschooling, you mm-hmm. can just go for it until they're six. And then they have to be either enrolled in school or have a homeschooling exemption. So mm. okay. it's quite a process like to fill out the form and you are kind of just trying to explain to them that you will be teaching your children mm. as, what are the terms, as well and as often as school. Or something like that. Oh, okay. Very, it's a kind of vague thing, mm-hmm. but you have freedom to actually teach them whatever you want. So you don't mm-hmm. actually have to follow the New Zealand curriculum. Mm-hmm. So you can just share what you're going to do, and then once you've got your exemption, then you're free to go. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'd cool. connect, maybe visit like a homeschooling local group, mm-hmm. um, get to know some people there who can talk about the the good and the bad and the ugly, and mm-hmm. you can make a informed decision yeah an informed decision and (laughs) do you you find that most people who are homeschooling their children are christian or are there a whole range we are a diverse bunch (laughs) so i'd say probably 
if you went back if 10 years, it would probably be more a Christian thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but with all the COVID stuff, there's a lot of people who have seen like the, that not happy with how much control um, the government and schools have over their children's lives and mm. like they didn't want their kids to be wearing masks and things like yeah. that so it kind of has um yeah things pushed a few ex- others that maybe might not have gone that route yeah um and then there's others who are just really it's like i don't want my kids restricted by they yeah. unschool so it's yeah. just like be wild and free uh-huh. and just uh-huh. learn however okay. whatever yeah. I, i'm not that extreme uh-huh Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Moderation. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to just switch now to some questions from our Instagram followers. So just bear with me one moment. I'm just going to pull them up because we had some real good ones. What advice would you give to young families going on the mission field soon? Mm. The person who asked this, that is what's happening in their life. Okay. Yeah. Um, depends how young their children are because... Quite young. Very young. Yes. Okay, well, there's not probably too much prep that you can do in that sense but like when we were going I read my children um there's a did you know Rosie Boom no she's like a New Zealand Christian homeschool mum oh cool um and she writes there's some good books as well the Barnyard Chronicles if anyone wants to read some good Kiwi books um she spent some time in Papua New Guinea Mm -hmm. as a kid and so she wrote um where the jungle calls so in preparation for my kids going over there, I read them that book. So they kind of understood a little bit of like mm. what it might be like. Mm-hmm. Um, I would find ways to, I guess, it's harder on the family left behind almost than the oh, really? family going. Mm. So grandparents and, um, yeah, trying to find a way that you can keep a connection with them. We're so blessed to live in a time where there is technology and you can video call and yeah. you know, when you think back in the day and it's just like send a letter and it might arrive, yeah. you know, two years after the person died yeah. to say hi, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, and I would just, yeah, have have a good understanding of who God is and um, a surety in your calling to go because there probably will be times on the mission field where you – question that and you need to know your why and Mm. um yeah just lean on the lord for that great advice um and another question that we had is kind of an easy one what curriculum do you use for homeschooling um i use a miss a mix and match of all sorts of things Mm. um so the core of my maths and like english is the good and the beautiful which is available free online to print off the pdfs Mm -hmm. it's a lot to print so Mm -hmm. you do have to consider that um but it's makes it easy you could never have taught a child in your life and it will give you a script fantastic say this to the child ask the child to do this and yeah so even if you're like i i can't teach maths Mm -hmm. it will do it for you Mm -hmm. so no degree needed (laughs) yeah and then i use um apologia science which is like a christian creation based um science exploring creation Mm -hmm. it's great it's always pointing to god as the creator and um as you're looking through different plants and animals and space it's like Mm. really gives you yeah an awe for god as the creator and seeing how he's intricately made everything. Mm. Um, I use story of the world for history, which I say that in New Zealand schools, you don't really learn history at all. (laughs) And when I first started homeschooling, I'm like, why do I need to teach them history? But wow, Mm. it's been fun and Mm. amazing. Like I Is it world history or or New Zealand? World history. World history. So I need it does include snippets of New Zealand. Mm. Um but because we're so small, we're not a very big emphasis in world history. Mm -hmm. So when I finish um, the last book I plan on doing like a more New Zealand history based one which I'll have to come up with myself I guess um, yeah. yeah and then online stuff just maths facts and things on there mm-hmm. my kids on their own without me actually expecting it of them are learning Mandarin using Duolingo <laughs> wow <laughs> um, which is fun yeah. I guess um, 
yeah, I don't make that their schoolwork because if I did, then they'd probably not want to do it. But mm. they're super motivated to do that. That's great. Okay, well, there is one question that I leave every guest with, and that is, how do you live your faith outside of Sunday? And that can mean, you can take that to mean whatever you want in terms of a reply. That could be internally, that could be in terms of sustaining your faith, or it could be externally in terms of how you uh, show your faith um, through your life. Yeah, I find it a funny question to answer because like Sunday is my favorite day of the week. But I mean, I guess my faith (laughs) is definitely like a a daily, hourly, moment to moment faith Mm -hmm. that cannot be contained in a Sunday morning. And yeah, it's just leaning on the Lord um, in every moment, depending on him for Mm -hmm. my strength and his leading in my life and being in his word constantly we need to um yeah just be really soaked in it Mm -hmm. because yeah the world around us is sending their lies all the time and so just to be yeah renewing our mind in his in the word to know what is true and good and yeah to follow him awesome well thank you so much katie for being here this has just blessed my heart so much I just felt like I could have just shut up my mouth and just let you talk the whole time because I just want to hear everything you have to say thank you so much um we're going to sign off but thanks everyone for listening and for watching and we'll catch you next time thank you great congrats you made it to the end of this episode of the outside of sunday podcast thanks for the support become an official outsider by liking and subscribing and leaving a five-star review if you'd like to connect with the podcast you can find me on instagram facebook and youtube just search outside of sunday podcast and don't forget to let someone you know know about this podcast